says the best part of waking up is Folgers in the cup. Best part of the morning is taking this thing off because I'm, I can be behind my bulletproof glass here. Well, good morning again. Get adjusted here. Anyone know that it's March? You figured that out? Looked at your calendar? Do you know that mud season's actually begun? A little bit. Yeah, my driveway, if you're off the pavement and get your tires over the sun, soften the stuff up, I've got mud splashing everywhere. It's March. So how many weeks till spring? Too many. The correct answer is too many. Actually, meteorologically, it's already spring. Just so you know that. The weather people do that, and that's their job is to mess us up. So how many of you are planning summer vacation yet? Do not show me your hands. I don't want to know actually. I just ask these kind of questions because some of you are planners. You've planned out you're probably your own funeral by now. You plan everything. And some of us aren't good planners. Um, and so, but from my own reading recently online and hearing things about, like, for example, the state parks, they're expecting a banner year this year. People are going to be on the move because things have loosened up a wee bit. So if you haven't planned, it might be worth making some kind of reservation. Um, Vacation, for most of us, for many of us anyway, it's time with extended family. And especially if you haven't traveled much in the last 12 months, and most of us haven't, um, then you hopefully will have a chance to do some traveling this summer and see people you haven't seen for a long time. And that is huge. I, I come from big families, plural, both sides of our, not me and my siblings, I just have an older brother and sister. But I have a zillion Parker cousins, as most of you know, I have a half million street and Fraser cousins, a much smaller group. And then, of course, the Duclo side goes on to infinity. So there's all these relatives, and we've had a chance to see a few of them, and that's always good. But it'll be fun to see some more. And uh, that's, that's what I'm hoping we're going to do this summer. You know, relationships are important to me. I think for many of you, it's important. Um, and we've all, especially through lives when we've lived a few years, We've gone through all kinds of relationship things, good relationships, damaged relationships, healed relationships. It's a difficult subject in so many ways. And that's just looking at it in the family, in marriage or the family. And then when you compound, compound that with church relationship or work or school relationships, there's a lot involved here. So in our reading today, the Apostle Paul is going to talk about Two relationships in particular, the marriage relationship and the church relationship. And he actually summarizes it pretty succinctly. It's a compact little thing that he outlines. But in even its compactness, it's loaded with a lot of good things. So this is where we're going, and this is where we've been. Ephesians thus far, when we started this in New Year's, going through these chapters so far, these are just the headings of what we've looked at. And then last week, and by the way, as I see it, because I'm the guy, you know, having to study and prepare this, I'm quite fascinated by how all of this sequence together. I, I don't believe Paul actually thought it through to that extent, but because the Holy Spirit was behind Paul in writing this out, it's a very cohesive letter, and it's very intentional in its direction. And so when he's talked about these things, it's no wonder that today he can finally talk specifically about relationships. But he literally needed to build up to that. And if you've missed any of this series, you can look it up on our Facebook page, on our website, or on our YouTube page. It's, it's all out there. And I, I need to review stuff. That's just how I'm, that's how I'm wired. If you don't use stuff a lot, you lose it, you review, it sticks better. So this is what we're going to look through today. Ephesians, the second half of this, Ephesians chapter 5. Last week we looked at the first half. And Paul has another warning. Paul has warnings don't do this and do that. It's very practical in his layout. Um, when people say, I don't know what to do as a Christian, I'm going to say, I haven't read very much. <laughs> you don't need to read a whole lot. You take any one, especially of Paul's prison epistles, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and he very clearly outlines some specific do's and don'ts. So not rocket science here, is it? Be careful, therefore, of the therefore is there, we need to know what the therefore is there for. He's saying because of the preceding presentations that I've made, the logic behind this would naturally flow, therefore I should behave in such a way. So he gives us some do's and don'ts. He talks about what it means to revere Christ and how that is an outflow of our human relationship. 
That part is, I guess, to me, the most fascinating part of this passage. And then he breaks it down very specifically to, in this part, next week we'll, he'll bring in the kids, but husbands and wives, their relationship and how it should work in its simplest terms. He doesn't go into a whole lot of specific specifics like who should pay the bills, who should clean the house, who should wash the car, who should do the shopping. That, that's not his concern. His concern is about relationships and all those other things that sometimes build in life's pressures. They come into their proper perspective as we understand the bigger principles. Ultimately, he is looking at our relationship with Christ and Christ's body here on earth, the church universal. It plays out in a local church, in a small group, but it's, it's of course, the big picture. So I'm going to read, I'm going to overlap a couple of verses from last week, but the second half of Ephesians chapter 5, and I'm reading from the New International Version. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. That's what I kind of call the hinge verse or the pivotal verse. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For though husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. So let's take this apart a little bit. There's a lot of words in here that because of our culture, because of our background, they're triggers. They're, they're kind of like hot potato items. They say you know, if people are sleeping in church, then you're not talking enough about marriage, sex, money, all those hot topics. People don't fall asleep when you talk about those. Well, this morning we're talking somewhat about marriage, but more importantly, this is our, a relationship passage. And the relationship passage, while he specifies husband and wife, it's a much broader picture because he's talking about Christ's relationship with the church. So he starts with a, a warning to be careful. And it's a universal warning. Some of you are careful by nature. You look out the window and you see if there's ice out there. Some of you run out the door and find out there's ice out there. You know, we're, we're all wired differently. But he warns us, be careful. Therefore, do not be foolish. What does it mean to be foolish? Oh, I'm ahead of myself. Then how you live. Not as the unwise, but as wise. And that's the slide I'm on. Sorry about that. Not as unwise, but wise. What's biblical wisdom? Some of you are familiar with the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs is called the book of wisdom. But the writers of Proverbs, it's obviously Solomon, but there's other writers too. Remember how they specify wisdom? What's the beginning of wisdom? Anyone remember? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That's a relationship. That's not a terror thing. That's a relationship thing. It's me. I know who he is, and I respect him in that. I know who I am, and there's a big difference. Not as the unwise, but the wise. And then he says, you make the most of every opportunity. You know why? Because we're in bad times. Now, Paul could say that in the Roman Empire, 
You have no idea what we'd be living through today. The days are evil in all kinds of ways, and so we are to be careful, wise, and make the most of our every opportunity. And as he goes down through here, he'll be very specific on how you and I can do that. Now he has his therefore. Therefore, do not be foolish. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. Again, from Proverbs. To be foolish, my definition, is to ignore or disregard God's purpose for your life. What? God's purpose? God has a purpose for every person on this earth. If you have breath and a pulse, God has a purpose for your life. You th we sometimes, because of our culture, think that means exactly what job I do or where I live, whom I marry, etc. And those are all part of that, but that's not the big picture purpose. The big purpose is for you to be in a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. That's His fundamental purpose. And when you and I are in that re relationship, and it's a healthy one between us and our Lord, the other details, which seem really big to us and they are important, then actually fall into place in a whole different way. Don't be foolish. Understand what the Lord's will is. God has a will or plan for every human being. I absolutely believe that. I know we have these billions of people on the earth. There's all kinds of stuff going on. But each person is specifically here because of God and known by God even when they don't know it. Every person is known by God. Remember Jesus said, you know, a sparrow falls to the ground, your father knows it. The very hairs of your head are numbered. And there's plenty of jokes about that one. But God is fully aware of what's going on in this earth, every human being, and he has a will and plan for their lives. But then Paul reins it in a little bit, and he says, now we're going to do some do's and don'ts. He's going to start with a don't. Don't get drunk on wine, what leads to debauchery. When's the last time at work you talked to somebody about debauchery? It's such a, a, a prevalent word in our, in our vocabulary, right? I go to the fire station. I'm tired of you guys' debauchery. That's just not going to work real well. So we need to know what the term is. Debauchery in the New Testament means the type of wild living, I, I like this definition, that is characterized by the prodigal son as seen in Luke 15. What do you remember about the prodigal son? What was his problem? You remember his problem? He'd had it with everything. He knew he had some inheritance. He says to his father, give me that money. I'm out of here. I'm going to go have fun. And he does for a short period of time. But what happens when you don't have income? You depend on the government. No, you, you end up, you depend. He, he couldn't do that back then. But anyway, so he ran out of money. A famine hits the land. He can't do anything. He's feeding pigs with husks, and he's so hungry. That looks really good to him. And he, he comes to his senses, and he says, what am I doing here? I'm going to go home, repent to my father. My father's got food, and he's going to take care of me. And there's a lot written about his brother, too. But we're basically looking at debauchery as this crazy living. Classical Greek is signified extravagant squandering of both money and of the physical appetites. We've lost all restraint. That's an interesting word, I think, in our culture today, to, to restrain ourselves. Not restrain others, but to restrain ourselves. Christians will avoid such excess. Because people are confused. Satan's done a good job saying God doesn't want you happy, healthy, or to have anything nice. That is not true. That's not the God I serve. God blesses, blesses, blesses. I have abundantly more than I ever would have dreamed I'd have. And it's all blessings from God. It's His generosity. It's His goodness. Yes, we're to work hard to provide for our families. But if, if we can, it's because God's given us the life, the breath, the ability to do that. It's all from Him. But when we live in excess... When you live beyond your income, live beyond your means, you will have problems. And people do that for a period of time, and then it snowballs. It doesn't work. Especially if you're just saying, hey, you know, let's, let's eat and drink for tomorrow we die. Who gives a rip? It doesn't work. Instead, he has an interesting analysis. I call it an analysis, very simply speaking. He says, be filled with the Spirit. And a lot of people have written about that. What does it mean to be filled with the Spirit? But I think Paul actually defines part of that in his next verses where he describes what that life is like. Speaking with one another, to one another, with music. We're communicating the grace of God, the love of God, the power of God when we sing His praises. And I thought, I, I personally, without studying it this time through, didn't kind of make that connection. Yeah, you don't do the bad stuff because that doesn't work. 
Here's something you can do. Be filled with the Spirit. What's that look like? You're, you're praising God. You're praising God. And your other Christian brothers and sisters are praising God. You're praising them together, speaking. And so this continues. Sing and make music where? From your heart to the Lord. It's from the inside because that's where the Spirit dwells. How do we do this? Excuse me. Always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We don't always like everything that's in our lives, but if God has a purpose for us, He's designed us. He's put us here on the planet. He knows you better than you know yourself. You can trust Him even when the things aren't going well. Then he, uh, he shifts gears, or I don't know if he shifts gears so much as, let me pull this together and make it really practical. How do we really live in the Spirit? We're going to sing praises. That sounds good. So he throws this in. Submit to one another. Now that's a tough word especially for some of us that don't like it. I don't like that word, okay? I, I mean, if I submit an entry to win something, that doesn't bother me with that definition. But if you say to me, you need to submit to me, I got a problem with that. I don't care who you are or what you ask me to do. Just the very fact you ask me to do something in submission, I, have a, I don't want to do that, whatever it is, you know? Um, I think that's classic human nature. I think some people are very, some are more compliant than others. Um, I don't know who you are or where you live, but some are more compliant than others. And so the submission thing doesn't bother you. But I think most of us, no, you d don't tell me what to do. Why do we react that way? Why do we react with the don't tell me what to do? You ever stop to think that one through? Yeah, the, the assumed answer is, I know more or I know better than you do, so don't tell me what to do. I've got this. Yeah, you ever tried to help your kids with something and they look at you and say, no, I've got this, and you look at them and you know, no, you haven't got this. Not even close, but, you know, sometimes good parenting is you let them experiment unless it's going to burn something or down or blow it up. You let them experiment and then figure it out because we learn sometimes just by figuring things out. But Paul says, no, we need to figure out what it means to submit to one another, and this next phrase is what helps me, out of reverence for Christ. Hmm. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Peter uses the same Greek word in his letter. He writes, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. And by the way, you're going to see the word respect again too. Revere Christ. To revere. That's not a word we use every day either. We, may, we know it may be a little better than the word debauchery, but what's he talking about here? Let's look at this. In the New Testament, Reverence occurs as the translation of three different Greek words. Now, you don't have to take Greek. I'll bet one of those words you can figure out it's the root to something else. Look at those words for a minute. And any of the words you might say, I think that might be connected to... What's the second one? Don't worry about pronouncing it correctly. All the ones that wrote this stuff are long dead. Phobia. What's a Phobia. A fear. So we're saying, well, what's that mean to fear God? What does that look like? It's a respect fear. That's what he's talking about. It's rooted in an understanding, again, of who God is and who I am. And there's a big difference there. So there's the words. Reverence is having humility toward God and recognizing as well as expressing His awe and greatness awe and greatness. There are times when I have set, had those sensations of awe. Usually it's, it's some connection with um, something visual in creation. Last summer we had a chance to spend the better part of a week up on, in, a, in a house, a cabin on the side of the mountain in Rangeley. We had spectacular, west-facing, spectacular sunsets. And we're looking across Rangeley Lake and Ball Mountains on the other side. And you have this spectacular sunset. And I, it just, that sense of awe came over me. What a great God. 
Years ago, I was fishing in the woods of northern Maine, Little Lyford Ponds, and we went out at night, and the guy had the telescope, and we're looking at the stars, and it, he brings it out there because there's no cities nearby. We have great darkness, and we can really see the stars and the planets. And I was in awe that night. I thought, my father created all that. And I've had those moments just even at nighttime going out in my front yard. Um, a while back, I was responding to a call in the night, not, nothing anybody wants to do. But I walk out my yard, and there's just all the stars out there. And I go, whoa, this, that's my God. He made all that. Those, those, they're, just, they're not all the time, but there's those moments, great moments of awe. And that, that should generate that respect, that proper sense of fear by the right definition of who God is, His character, His nature. So to revere. So he says our relationship is to submit to one another out of a special kind of deep respect. Now he gets very particular on what that's to look like. And this is where our culture collides, and we'll talk about that more in a minute. But here's the verses again. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. I looked at multiple translations of this, and they can't get away from that Greek word's definition as much as we, we, women, might like to be a different word there. That's what it is. So when they are submit to the husband as to whom? So that means they're kind of like in a psychotic person because I'm not God. And if you're married, you know your husband's not God, long ways from it. And uh, so what's he talking about? But there's that reverence, respect issue comes back in here. And then Paul actually puts the greater burden on the husband because he defines his role as head of the wife, as Christ is head of the church, his body of which he is Savior. Responsibility. You have a job, if any of you have a job, you have some kind of defined responsibility for that job. You are to get done something. Some of you have projects you're to get done, but whatever it is, when you're responsible for something, that's what you got to do. Christ is responsible for His church, and He's doing a fine job with that, if we'll cooperate with Him. But then I am to understand my relationship with my wife because it's, it's a place of responsibility. I am to care for my wife Lois in a position of responsibility, not in a dictatorial sense, not in a bossy sense. That doesn't work. How many of you saw my big fat Greek wedding of way back? Everyone saw that. Okay. The husband may be the head, but the wife is the neck. You've seen the movie. The head doesn't move without the neck because they had to do a little convincing there, and the wife says, my paraphrase, I can do this because he may be the head, but I'm the neck. There's a little Greek Orthodox theology for you there, but anyway. Head and the neck. He is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands and everything. Now I have lived through some application of this that I don't think was correct in Bible teaching. I know there are church groups out there that I, my personal thinking is they do not understand the context and flow here, and so they live with a very much a male authoritarian system in their church hierarchy, male dominant. And if you read the Old Testament, it is a very male dominant culture in, in, with that. But as I continue to study Paul's writings, I, Paul actually breaks that apart in our, you, the, number one, we're unique, male and female. In spite of what our culture says, in spite of what's going on in Washington and elsewhere, God makes us male and female. It shows up in everything from blood labs to physical appearance. That's who we are. We're, we're hardwired that way. God only made two sexes, and even though people try to change that around, that's what God does. That's His deal. He's the Creator. So we got to understand who He is and who we are, and the submission thing comes out of this respect and understanding of our roles and needs. So he shifts to the husband's roles. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. And what did he do? He gave himself up for her. At what point did Jesus give himself up for the church? Death, torture and death. And most of us would think, ain't doing that for my marriage. <laughs> That's not an option. And yet, there's a, this is the calling Paul's talking about. What am I willing to give up, sacrifice, let go of for the sake of my wife? To do it out of respect for Christ. Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. There was a purpose in that. Whoops. Back, 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 back. <laughs> 
to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any of the blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, you know, you do take care of yourself. No one ever hated their own body. They feed and take care of it. The husband's role, the wife's role. And it's all a picture, Paul says, of this other relationship, the church, just as Christ does for the church, for we're members of His body. So then he looks at God's design of marriage and says, this is the picture of the church. Right from the beginning of creation up until the Lord returns, this is the picture. This reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you also whoops, must love his wife, even as he loves himself, and the wife must, there's that word again, respect her husband. Love and respect here are key words. Um, uh, there's a book out there, I meant to put it in my slides, if you look it up on um, Amazon or one of the other ones, Love and Respect, it's a marriage book. Lois and I have read parts of it. We haven't read it cover to cover, but each chapter is kind of freestanding. There's some great teaching there. The guy used to do workshops. Uh, a couple I know went to one of his workshops, and they said, get the book, because he makes it look like I talk slow. He's talking at 200 miles an hour through the workshop, and they said, uh, at least in the book, you can pace it out. But he breaks down these words and what it's supposed to look like in a marriage relationship. Let me kind of step away in a moment from the Scripture and try share with you my understanding of it a little bit. And I'm still learning. I'm still growing like you do. Principle number one, God created us for relationships. Now, I know some people are outgoing. Some people would rather be a hermit. They'd rather live in the woods by themselves, never see anybody. Like the guy in central Maine that whatever, how many years he lived in the woods, he just robbed cabins to get canned goods. Most of us aren't quite wired that badly. But anyway, relationships. In this passage, Paul specifically looks at two relationships. The first is marriage, which is the principal relationship for the here and now on this earth. By God's design, by His purpose, marriage of one man, one woman, until death do they part. For eternity, the other relationship is with the Godhead, and of course with others that have gone on before and the rest of heaven's created beings. But ultimately, that relationship is with the Godhead, with the Father, Son, and Spirit. These two relationships, by God's design, intentional design from the creation until now, are really the, the fundamental relationships of everything else, family, work, whatever, is marriage and the church and how that reflects in our eternal relationship, of course, with God. But here's the deal. As I worked on this, trying to think it through, we are under attack. There's a great conflict going on culturally, and there has been. There has been since, since they went, they, Adam and Eve left the Garden of Eden. There's been this conflict. Satan hates what God likes. We are the, the human being is the epitome of God's creation. We are created in His image for His glory, so Satan hates people. And if he hates us and he hates God, he hates the design of God, the purpose of God, the work of God. And that work of God, ultimately, that Satan wants to undesign is the basic fundamental relationships. And Satan is a cheater. He's a, th a thief and a liar. He, uh, Jesus said in John chapter 10, the thief comes only to do what? Steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus says, let me define it in the clearest terms. Then he goes on to say, I've come that you may have life. And the newer translation says, have it to the full, which is what our hearts desire. We want full lives, full of God, full of healthy relationships. That fullness is what God's after. But Satan doesn't like that, doesn't like any of it. So where does he start? Biblical marriage. Even as I read again in the Old Testament, marriage was limping along before the gospel. Men had many wives or concubines, and you can't go very far in the Old Testament to see that didn't work. There were a lot of problems with that. And the good thing about the Old Testament is it's not masked. It's, it's just out in the open. They didn't play well together. 
there were problems all the way through there. And when we get to the time of Christ, he says, no, it's God's design for a man to leave his parents, cleave to his wife, they become one flesh. This is the mystery. Paul is repeating the words of Jesus here. But our culture has undermined marriage, the culture triggered, promoted by none other than Satan himself. So marriage is not a big deal anymore. Why would I get married if it's going to end up in divorce anyway? You know what the divorce rate is for Christians in contrast to the rest of the human race? Identical, 50%. It is. I, I wish I could tell you a different statistic. It's been that way for quite a while too. The problem with even marriage and divorce certificates is now compounded by people don't get married. They just live together. That's not God's design. God's design is based on commitment and trust, and that's what the marriage vow, which actually the modern, well, not modern, but the traditional marriage vow is based on Jewish tradition, believe it or not, and it's based on this covenant that I covenant with a person to be only for them. People say, well, I'm in a monogamous relationship. It's the same thing as marriage. Or I don't want to get married because it changes my tax status and I don't get the benefits that I get by not being married. All these things are, I'll just be blunt, Satan's tools to undermine God's design. Whether the government blesses marriage or not is irrelevant. We want to do what the Bible says. Satan has attacked biblical marriage, and I'm sorry to say he's done quite a job at undermining it. I was talking to someone not long ago. They were talking about their relationship. They have kids, young kids. And I said, why don't you get married? Well, I'm not ready for that. I said, well, you got kids. Didn't mess around a whole lot. You got kids. Well, yeah, but we're not financially ready. Now, what makes them not financially ready? I don't need to be a rocket scientist, but if mom's home with the kids and not married to them, she falls under what? Government programs, subsidies, insurance, etc. So why get married? There's no incentive for that. And I, every time they come out with these laws that take away from marriage incentives, I don't necessarily, I don't like the legislators doing that, but I don't blame them because it's diabolical. It comes from the one who hates what God designed. We live in a time, even compared to other empires from my reading, like the Roman Empire, we've had lots of immorality all through the earth's history. That's immorality is natural, not, that's what people do. When people don't have guidelines and don't have barriers, they do bad things. And they do bad things sexually because God created us as sexual beings by His design and purpose. But everything around us attacks biblical sexuality. So we're now, as you see and hear in the news, that anybody who thinks their gender is this can play in the sports program for that other gender. A guy can think he's a girl and he can run in you know, track and field events with other girls and go to the shower with them. Who actually thinks this an ounce of sensibility to this? I can't believe that people talk about it openly like this is a good thing. It is from the pit. It is from Satan. It goes totally against God's design. Just because somebody thinks there's something doesn't make it, make it it. If I think I'm a Big Mac, it doesn't mean I came from McDonald's. Just because you think you're something doesn't make it so, Okay. So you can think anything you want about your sexuality or your identity. It doesn't change genetically, chromosomally who you are. You're, that's who we are. But it's under attack. It's under attack as much as any other culture I've read about in history. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to be fallout for this. We're all seeing it in our families. We see it because marriage has been under attack. We see it because human sexuality is under attack. Anything actually that you could define as a biblical relationship is under attack by God's enemy, Satan. So that, that includes what? The church. The church is under attack. God does not want us to have healthy, trusting relationships. He, God, Satan doesn't want, you know, people do sin and fail, but God doesn't want to see forgiveness. I mean, God. Satan doesn't want to see forgiveness, reconciliation, healing, all the things that happen under the gospel. That's God's intention. So how do, we, how do we answer this? How do we deal with Scripture? I think what I try to do as pastor teacher is to be clear what Scripture says. Do I put my spin on it? Oh yeah, I will. Every pastor, my background, my personality, all those things come into play here. But as much as I can, I want to be clear what Scripture says, and I personally think Paul's Scripture is pretty clear. A culture cannot define relationships in a healthy way. Any culture, it can't do it outside of God. Even the Jewish people 
with God's covenants, their culture could not define proper relationships. God defines relationships as what they should be. So we've got to go back and read Scripture. We must read and understand God's design and plan as outlined in Scripture, as outlined in the Bible. And we must keep going back to that because we're bombarded. I, you know, it's too bad. Even with movies, uh, we like to watch everybody. Most everybody likes to watch movies. But you don't have to go very far into a movie. And are they following anything even remotely close to God's design for a man-woman relationship? No. No, they're not. We've been told that, well, if you're consensual, it's okay. Watch where they, where they run with that one, by the way. The age of 18 won't mean much if given enough time. This, the, we're in a mess. We're in a sexual mess here. And everybody's trying to redefine it. Every one of these things, when you look at them, is an attack against biblical living. It's an attack against the God who created us and loves us and wants us to have a healthy, happy life even here and now. So we need to read and understand God's design and plan as outlined in Scripture. We, not me, you, if we're the body of Christ, if we're the church, if we have taken Jesus as our Lord and Savior, then we must be clearly committed to following our Lord in healthy relationships, in healthy biblical relationships. And it always starts first in our families, in our houses. It's always the first place. And you see that, again, right from Genesis on through. But then that has to interplay within the church. The greater the number of people, in my opinion, the more complicated it is, obviously. Um, if you want to have a disagreement, if excuse me, I said it wrong. If you never want to disagree with anybody, how, how should you live? Alone. And you'll still argue with yourself. I do, you know. Nobody may be home, but I can be in my house and argue with myself. So anyway, but you, you don't want to have a disagreement. You're never with anybody. We're all with somebody, so we're going to disagree. How do we deal with that? How do we respect and love our wives, our husbands, in a way that honors Christ, that reveres Christ, and says, no, Jesus comes first in this. What does the Bible say about this? Forgive me. I ran my mouth. I shouldn't have done that. I've said that a few times. Maybe nobody else has, but I've had to say that a few times. I probably will again. But anyway, I don't want to do it again, but that's the way it goes. We must be clearly committed to following our Lord in healthy relationships, of course in our families and of course in our churches. When we are who we are, as the saying goes, when no one's looking, when we are who we are in our homes, when we are who we should be in the church, when we're the real deal, the light of the gospel works like it can't in any other way. There's something about the genuineness of a disciple of Christ that really dispels darkness. I found this in a candy wrapper. We have um, a dove, dove chocolates, and they have little sayings in the candy wrappers. So, I'm, you know, you always want to look for good sermon material in your dove chocolate candy wrappers. When life isn't going right, what do you do? That's, that would be my go-to, yeah. Go left. So this was in my candy wrapper, and I went, this is perfect. I'm left-handed anyway. So when life isn't going right, you go left. It means a change of direction. You, and most of you know this that are here. Repentance is a change of direction. I'm going the wrong way. I, I realize finally it's the wrong way. There's only been a couple times in my life when I have gone the wrong way down a one-way road. Um, I went for a little short stretch, stretch a few years ago in the city of Lewiston. It didn't amount to anything. There weren't any cars. I figured it out pretty quickly, or Lois did, and we got turned around. That was no problem. However, years ago, we were lost, and we're in New Jersey, in Newark, and I was confused, and I started down a one-way street, and there were cars, and that wasn't fun. That wasn't fun. Why is everybody beeping and swerving? <laughs> there, could, there could be a reason. <laughs> And so I'm, they're all idiots. Whoops. Anyway, so if you're going the wrong way, you've got to turn around. Jesus calls us to follow. That actually has a direction to follow him. I can't run off on my own. I can't just do my own thing. But I need grace in doing that. I'm not really a good follower. Years ago, somebody told me that. Ron, you're not much of a follower. And I took that as a compliment. <laughs> Not everybody would, but anyway, whatever. I tend to question things. I ask a lot of questions. 
I think it's okay to ask questions as long as you get what? Good answers, yeah, yeah. If you answer, if you ask questions and you're getting just stupid answers, um, yeah. And there's a lot of that around. We all know that. And sometimes I give you pretty stupid answers too, but you're smart enough to figure that out. Jesus calls us to follow. If you're not clear about something, ask questions. But following Christ is the thing. And there is always grace for us. Mercies are new every morning. I, more and more I'm waking with this verse, waking up with this verse pretty early on in my, as the brain engages into the day. God's mercies, and you may have not thought of it this morning when you crawled out of bed or fell out of bed, whatever you did, but God's mercies were new for you this morning, and they will be tomorrow morning. And you say, well, I've made a mess out of things. I, have, I didn't know God's plan. I didn't follow His plan. You can, if you're not going the right way, go left. You can make a turn. There's mercy and grace for you. The Bible tells me when we identify sin, whatever that may be, and we come to Jesus, that the blood of Jesus, His Son, cleanses us from how much? You know the next word? All. All sin. That's the God we serve. That's the God that loves you, that loves me. When we finally have that aha moment and go, well, I'm not doing it God's way. This is what He wants. I want to do it God's way. There is grace for you right in that moment. There is absolute grace. There's forgiveness. I want my marriage to be better. I, know, I want to learn what it means to really love and respect my wife to help my wife. And as we each do our part in that marriage relationship, I want to learn what it means to submit to one another, especially in the church, in the name of Christ. It's, it takes time, and we need to give each other grace. But God's got the grace for us. Amen? We are going to close with a... Amen. Hallelujah. He Amen. is. Amen? Lord, you are worthy of all praise, honor, and glory, and power. And we have kind of been figuring that out little by little through life. You are the blessed, the creator God, and of course, our Lord and Savior, if we will have you so. Maybe there's someone watching this morning, someone just not sure about this. I don't know what that means. You can know what that means. Right now, just say, Jesus, be my Lord. Come into my heart and my life. I know I'm a sinner, and I need you as my Savior. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. Now may I know you more. May I have that lasting relationship starting right now that goes right on through eternity. And it's only because of his love and his grace. And Lord, for the rest of my brothers and sisters here who know you, may we have a renewed commitment to walk with you in holiness, biblically, in obedience to your word. In spite of the confusion the culture is generating all around us, we turn to you, Spirit of God. We confess our sins. And we find that you change our direction. We're able to walk in obedience with you and find the blessing, the relationship, that, the growing, deepening relationship that only you can provide. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. So we will go with his grace. Thank you for coming here today. You that are here, hang on for a few minutes. We'll uh, talk about a few things. Also, if you're watching on Facebook, this is the first Sunday of the month. We will have our monthly communion service via Facebook. Uh, at 1230 next month April it's going to be in here it's going to be in the chapel it's overdue we're doing it so thank you uh, stay tuned God bless